Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a student talking to the accommodation coordinator at her school. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Sarah, I've heard that you want to move into a homestay family. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I've been staying with my aunt and now my cousin is arriving from Singapore and my aunt needs the room for him. Oh, that's bad luck. Well, I'll need to get some particulars first. Um, Sarah, what's your full name? Sarah Lim. And that's Sarah without the H at the end. Linda asks for Sarah's full name, Sarah Lim, so this has been written in the notes. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Sarah, I've heard that you want to move into a homestay family. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I've been staying with my aunt and now my cousin is arriving from Singapore and my aunt needs the room for him. Oh, that's bad luck. Well, I'll need to get some particulars first. Um, Sarah, what's your full name? Sarah Lim. And that's Sarah without the H at the end. Mm -hmm. How old are you, Sarah? 23, only just. It was my birthday on the 21st of August. Oh, happy birthday for yesterday. How long have you been in Australia? A year in Adelaide and six months in Sydney. I prefer Sydney. I've got more friends here. What's your address at your aunt's house? Flat one. 539 Forest Road, Canterbury. And the postcode is 2036. OK. What are you studying now? I was studying general English in Adelaide and now I'm doing academic English because I'm trying to get into medicine next year. That sounds good, but it'll take you a long time. When would you like to move out from your aunt's? My cousin arrives on Friday morning, so I'd better be out on Thursday. What, the 7th of September? Yes, that's right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. That doesn't leave us much time. Right, OK. I need to know what kind of accommodation you'd like so I can get you something suitable. Can I share a room with someone else? I've been alone in my room at my aunt's and I've always shared with my sister and I like that. Yes, fine. That'll save you money too. <laughs> Would you like to live with a family or do you think that a single person would be better for you? I have lots of very nice single people on my books. Do you have any women living alone, retired women? Yes, I have quite a few whose children have grown up and left home. In fact, I have some really lovely retired ladies living by themselves who just love the company of students. Most of them live in flats, but that's not a problem for you, is it? Not at all. I'm used to that. My aunt lives in a flat too, remember? Hmm. I'm not used to a big house with a garden, swimming pool, pets and all that. OK, fine. I know quite a bit about what you want now. I should let you know that your rent will be $160 per week. 
You'll have to pay me $320 as a deposit before you move in. The deposit is as insurance in case you break something. You'll need to pay monthly to me by cash or check, I don't mind. You don't need to pay for gas, electricity or water, but you will need to pay your proportion of the phone bill. Most families do that on an honour system, but you'll have to wait and see. Hmm. Have you got any more questions for me? Uh, when will you know where I can go? I'll work on it now. So come and see me tomorrow and I should have some news for you then. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. After lunch will be better for me. OK. See you then. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse, just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that, you're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions, the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, the little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a creche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sites tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people, or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get 15% off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs $10.00 but this year it's just $7. When you hand it in, 
you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red explorer symbol. Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look at that is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, guys, first off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star? Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous, and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far? as it has done already. Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but... Notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question. Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal while he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we won't rely on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. 
We did, however, find the library's sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction, well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that, sadly, you ran out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of Section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. In this section, you will hear a talk about chocolate. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces numbered 31 to 38 and circle the appropriate letter for questions 39 to 40. First, you will have 30 seconds to look at this section. Now listen to the talk and do questions 31 to 40. 
Good morning, everyone. Today, my talk is going to be about chocolate. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of chocolate, but first, I'm going to tell you a story about Julia Proctor. She eats her favourite food. She feels guilty. She knows that chocolate has a lot of fat and sugar, but Julia says she is addicted to chocolate, and once she starts eating it, she can't stop. Julia isn't the only one who is addicted to chocolate. It is a favourite food for people all over the world, and in a survey of sixteen different countries, people preferred chocolate to ice cream, cakes, and cookies. In the United States, chocolate is a ten billion dollar industry. For Valentine's Day, for example, people spend over four hundred million dollars on chocolate. The idea of eating chocolate didn't begin until the nineteenth century. Before that, people drank chocolate. The custom began in Central America, where the Aztecs drank bowls of chocolate to stay alert. When the liquid chocolate was brought to Spain in the 1500s, people thought it was medicine because it tasted bitter like other medicines. In fact, the people who made chocolate into drinks were either druggists or doctors. Then people discovered that mixing chocolate with sugar made a wonderful drink. King Ferdinand of Spain loved this drink so much that he put out an order. Anyone who talked about chocolate outside the court would be killed. So, for about one hundred years, chocolate was a secret in Spain. But finally, people found out about chocolate, and it became a popular drink throughout Europe. In the eighteen hundreds, a British chocolate maker discovered a way to make chocolate smooth and velvety. Then the Swiss added milk to the chocolate. Today, most Americans prefer milk chocolate, while most Europeans prefer dark chocolate. Now, research shows that chocolate is actually good for us because chocolate has a variety of vitamins and minerals. And it has more than three hundred different chemicals. One chemical works on the part of the brain that feels pleasure. People who feel good when they eat chocolate are actually healthier, because feeling pleasure is important for health and could protect against illness. Good chocolate doesn't have much fat or sugar. You can enjoy it if you eat a little at a time. So. Thinking about Julia Proctor, who I mentioned at the beginning, if you just eat a little at a time, that isn't a